Greetings out there to everyone watching us on the internet. I am John Welsh, a graduate student of Italian here at Harvard University. And I'm joined here today by our next guest in the De Balsas Colloquium in Italian Studies. Professor Raymond Jonas is professor of history at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he's here to talk with us today about his new book, The Battle of Adwa, African Victory in the Age of Empire. Professor Jonas, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'd like to start off with a very basic question. Could you just set the stage for anyone who might not be familiar with the Battle of Adwa? Sure. So the Battle of Adwa took place in the Ethiopian highlands on the 1st of March, 1896. And it was a confrontation between an Italian army and an Ethiopian army that resulted in a triumphal victory for Ethiopia and a disastrous defeat for Italy. The loss of life on the Italian side out of about 18,000 men was close to 6,000. They had almost 3,000 prisoners. The Ethiopian casualties were even higher, probably close to 20,000 out of maybe as many as 100,000, but they won. So uh, at least for those who survived, the casualties were acceptable. Now, in your book, you do a great job describing exactly why the Battle of Abwa is so crucially important. Could you say a few words about why this victory for Ethiopia was so important, not only for Italy and for Ethiopia, but for the future direction of world politics? There were a couple of firsts that are built into the story of Adwa, and one of them is that this is the first time that an African army had defeated, definitively defeated, a European army. I mean, there had been setbacks before. The British had a terrible setback in their war with the Zulu uh, a few years earlier, but it was a setback. I mean, eventually, I mean, the, the outcome was never really in doubt. This was, this was, I suppose, for someone thinking of U.S. history, something like Custer's Last Stand, that it, you know, it was a, it was a serious defeat, but uh, uh, part of a, a, an overwhelming and unrelenting process. The victory of the Ethiopians was definitive. It meant that Ethiopian sovereignty was defended, successfully defended, and that made Ethiopia the only African country not to be colonized during the, the period of high empire. That's, uh, that's astonishing to think about. Uh, it was astonishing now. It's still is astonishing now. At the time, I mean, what made it especially, I think, important was that the common sense in the late 19th century had it that Africa was going to suffer the fate that the Americas suffered, that they would be colonized and populated by Europeans. And Adwa, in a very dramatic fashion, put that scenario into doubt. One of the aspects I most enjoyed in your book was telling about what happened both before and after the actual Battle of Adwa. And especially, I was impressed by the rise to power and the preparations made by Menelik. Do you think it would be fair to say that the battle was really won before it even started? Yes. I mean, there is a sense in which it was won, although I, I don't think anyone could have predicted Ethiopian victory. Uh, looking back, we can say, yes, we can see how this unfolded in a way that that uh, strongly favored Ethiopian victory. But uh, the emperor, the Ethiopian emperor, a man named Menelik, was, in fact, in the beginning of the, of the story, he's a provincial monarch. He's from a, a southern province called Shoa, and, and he's really someone who struggles uh, to come to, to power as an emperor, in part by undermining the current emperor, uh, a, a man named Johannes, who rules from the north. So uh, Menelik is a scrambler. He's a guy who, in fact, enters into negotiations with the Italians early on in order to undermine Johannes uh, in hopes of succeeding him. Uh, the Italians are willing to support Menelik in his enterprise, in part by giving him firearms, some which will be used against Italian soldiers at Adwa, because they're in effect sponsoring him. They think that if Menelik wins, if he topples Emperor Johannes and becomes Emperor of Ethiopia, he'll be their man. Uh, they will have been his sponsor when Menelik comes to power. He does what I think could have been predicted, he begins to separate himself from the Italians and carve out for himself a uh, position as uh, no longer as a southerner, but as the emperor of all the Ethiopian people. And it's from that position that he begins then to settle accounts with the Italians. 
Uh, it's not as though he's entirely ungrateful. Uh, modern Eritrea, uh, just to the north of Ethiopia, is an effective gift of Menelik uh, to the Italians uh, for uh, their support. But ultimately, uh, he uses uh, the Italians, and uh, when he's in a position finally strong enough to resist them, he does. You know, the, the, the way he does that is, you know, an, an, a, you know a, a, a complicated story, but in effect, he, um, he has to overcome some internal challenges. There are others who want to topple him, just as he tried to topple his predecessor. Uh, but he's he's a brilliant strategist, and he can. He, he, it's part of the story is just to see how he makes the most of the limited resources he has in order to bring down a formidable opponent. Now, the reaction to this unprecedented victory by the Ethiopians by an African army was difficult to understand, to grasp, both in Italy and abroad. And there were a number of really strange misconceptions. I recall the, the anecdote of a newspaper publishing a caricature of Menelik clearly depicting him as a white man. Yes, it's, it's I mean, part of the challenge of, of, of defeat at Adwa is that this is a defeat, uh, not only of a European army, but it's a defeat by a black army. And it's, so it, it inverts the, the racial hierarchy of the day, which assumes European dominion over the world. And this not challenges the notion of dominion, but also uh, upsets the notion of, of uh, white superiority. And this has impacts around the world. Uh, in, in fact, in the States, one of the ways that I approached the topic was by looking at how the American press covered the story. And, and one of the earliest images that, of, of Menelik that went out in the, in the American press uh, sh showed a, uh, an Ethiopian monarch who looked for all the world like uh, he could be the Tsar of Russia, uh, uh, recently coronated. Uh, uh, and then there were stories, too, that the Ethiopians weren't African at all, but in fact of Phoenician descent. There are different ways that people are struggling to come to terms with this very shocking uh, uh, outcome, uh, trying to understand how this could happen and ultimately interpreting the events in ways that... Uh, that, that take the, the, the racial hurt, the racial dimension of the story away. Now, of course, there were African soldiers on both sides of yes. the conflict, however. Yes. The Italians learned early on, after some, um, some initial skirmishes, that the best way to increase the size of their army was to hire local soldiers, mercenaries in effect. They called Ascari. And uh, they found that there were lots of advantages. They, they, they were local. They knew the terrain. Uh, they were a lot faster than Europeans. Uh, they didn't have the climate issues that European soldiers had to deal with. They operated very effectively at the very high altitude that Ethiopia sits at, about 2,000 meters. Uh, and they didn't have to be paid a lot. So you could have a large army um, uh, without putting a, a lot into it. So the Italian army, in fact, is an army that's commanded by white European officers. But the rank-and-file soldiers, uh, to a great extent, are African. They may be Sudanese, they may be Eritrean, they may be um, Somali, and some of them, in fact, are probably Ethiopian. Uh, uh, but they're fighting for Italy. Uh, and they... Um, so, in effect, when we look at... If you were to look at the, uh, the Odwa battlefield, you would see, you would see not, a, not entirely a white and black army, but you would see a black army commanded by whites. It's a very different vision of what the future of Africa might look like. Mm. Now, just to kind of bring things full circle back to the occasion of your speech, which is the De Bozis Colloquium in Italian Studies, right. this is obviously a book that has a great deal to do with, with Italy. Right. I'd like to ask you, what do you think are the most important lessons for, of Adwa for Italian scholars, people interested in, in the future of, of Italy and as well as Italy's past? I think one of the really extraordinary things about the Adwa story is that it's a story of the Italian diaspora. So for Italian studies, this is a story that quite naturally moves from the Italian peninsula uh, into the broader world. One of the things that fascinated me in the Italian archives is to look at the, the profound response of people of Italian origin uh, from across the world to the story of Adwa. They reacted in different ways, but they, they all reacted. And so you, many of them are offering donations, so from Malta, from Istanbul, from uh, Tunisia. I remember the Italian-Americans were up in arms. They New Jersey, to... uh, from Chicago, um, 
Uruguay, uh, Sao Paulo. I mean, all the places we know are important parts of the Italian diaspora. They all respond in different ways. In fact, many of them by raising money to send e either for the care of the soldiers who uh, have been wounded uh, or for the families of the, that have lost sons in the combat uh, or um, for, uh, to, to raise an, an army uh, to uh, seek some sort of revenge. There are different reactions, depending, in fact, on the circumstances in which the broader um, Italian diaspora finds itself. Um, it, is, it, it is very much a, a, a story of Italianita. Uh, for Italy, of course, th there is the aftermath of the 1930s. Uh, the defeat of Ad was one of the uh, arguments that Mussolini and the fascists would use uh, uh, to justify going back in the 1930s to avenge the, uh, the defeat of Adwa. Uh, that's not a story I go into in the book, but it, obviously it's a, it's a story that, uh, it's in fact a story that's more often uh, known. Uh, the, the, the predecessor, the first act, if you like, right. to that story happens in 1896 at Adwa. Well, many thanks again for being here to Professor Raymond Jonas. The book again is Battle of Ottawa.